What's up, great students? Welcome tonight. We have an awesome, awesome time plan for you. And to kick it off, I want to introduce you to two new friends. So we have two new interns that are joining us tonight. Uh, this is going to be an awesome summer with them. There are also going to be two more that you will meet. Uh, there's one at the North Campus and one at the Olathe Campus. Uh, but tonight, I want to let them introduce yourself. So this is Abby and Leslie. And uh, I'll let you guys just say, uh, where are you coming from? Abby, I know you maybe are a little more familiar with maybe the viewers. Uh, uh, but uh, let us know, you know, who you are and how you got here and yeah. Yeah, so I'm Abby. Um, I go to Johnson County Community College and I'm sure a lot of you guys know me, but if you don't, um, I kind of run like the Instagram account here and I'm so excited to be your guys' campus support intern. Sweet. Leslie, how about you? Hey guys, I'm Leslie. I am from Lansing, Kansas. I currently go to school at Evangel University and I learned about Grace through Evangel kind of, so that's awesome. Um, but that's just a little, about, a little bit about me and I can't wait to meet all you guys in person. Yeah, that's awesome. So fun fact, Evangel is also where Kyle Williamson went, our high school director, or, or sorry, new Grace students director at our uh, South OP campus. And so uh, we're going to do a little fun game with them tonight. We've got uh, one uh, truth, two truths and a lie to start out, and then we're going to test their knowledge of a few interesting facts. So, are you ladies ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. So we're going to do this. I'm going to ask them to give you two truths and a lie. We're going to give you 30 seconds or so to then judge, maybe 15, 20 seconds to judge uh, which one is the lie. We're going to talk about it amongst ourselves, and then we're going to find out from them uh, how good of liars they truly are, because that's, is that important? That's probably not important for their role here, but let's check it out. So two truths and a lie. So I have been out of the country. I am a black belt in Taekwondo and I have been to Disney World in Florida 32 times. Wow. Okay, well there's your three options. You got some time on the clock. Decide, put your answer in the chat and we'll come back. The lie was, I have not been out of the country. Wow, did not see that coming. I'll be completely honest. So that's Abby. Now let's check with Leslie. Okay, so I am allergic to grapes. I have lived in Kansas my entire life, or I have written and produced a short film. Whoa, I'll be honest. I really hope that that last one is true. I would love to see that. So. How about you? What do you think is the lie of those three? Put your answer in the chat. We'll have some time on the clock. Here we go. All right, so my lie was that I haven't lived in Kansas my whole life. Wow, so there is definitely that film out there that we need to watch. All right, we're going to transition here into a debate because that skill might actually come in handy uh, in their time as interns. Uh, so here's the debate. Is water wet? Is water wet? Some of you maybe are familiar with this. Some of you are wondering, like, why is this even a debate? I'm kind of in that camp. But put your answer in the chat and let's hear from them. Uh, Abby, you're gonna, you went first last time. So, Leslie, we're going to have you go first and you're going to defend why water is wet. Go for it. All right, so water is wet because whenever you like jump in the pool, you come out and you're wet. Like you get wet from the water, therefore the water is wet. But, you know, there could be some conflict to that, but I don't think it's right. So, but water is wet. Interesting. I think that's probably the best argument, just saying water is wet. So that just <laughs> makes sense. But go ahead, Abby. Let's, let's see what you have to say. Okay, so water is not wet and i'm actually using the same exact argument as uh leslie because when you're in the pool you are in the water but as soon as you get out of the water that's when you become wet because wet is the presence of water but water itself is not wet because you're in the water so it's when you get out of the water that you become wet well that's given us a lot to think about let's see what our judges think Wow, uh, these are hard. I'm I'm gonna say that I, I think I agree with Abby Bantham uh, that 
you're not wet when you're in the water, but when you get out, you have to dry off. So that you're wet when you get out of the water. You don't dry out in the water because you're not wet. Fair, fair. I think so. I think Abby won the debate. I disagree with her point because I think even though you're you're in the water and you are wet in the water, you just can't identify that you are yet. So I, I, if I had a debate, which I'm not doing, I'm just giving my opinion on who won the debate. So I think Abby won the debate. Well, there you have it. That is, uh, that's a great debate, and here's another one for you. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Is a hot dog a sandwich? Take it away. I think a hot dog is a sandwich, because when you make a sandwich, there's like meat and condiments in between, and it's, that's basically what a hot dog is, so I think it is a sandwich. I would say a hot dog is not a sandwich, but in fact a taco. Because a sandwich is two pieces of bread with something in between, but a taco is like an encasing, and a hot dog bun encases the hot dog. So a hot dog is in fact a taco. I think we should go to the judges. <laughs> Check it out. Is a hot dog a, a sandwich, or I guess a taco? Um, I, I, I would probably have to side with Abby Bantam again and go uh, that a hot dog is not a sandwich. But I, so I think Abby won the debate. Um, I would wonder if a, does that make a taco a sandwich or a hot dog a taco? I, I there's more questions than I have answers. I don't feel like anything really got resolved um, inside of inside of Abby's argument. But debate wise, I'm, I'm siding with Abby. <sighs> this is a hard one again. I, I don't think I'm gonna go see none of the above. <laughs> because here's why. I think in my mind, a sandwich has two pieces of bread. No, you're not debating. This, this is, okay. who won the debate? You are a judge, uh, Ryan Sander, not a fellow debater. I'm gonna go with Leslie. <laughs> it's a sandwich. All right, we've got one more for you. Uh, check this out. So we're gonna debate whether Windows or Mac is better. Windows or, or Apple. Windows or Apple is better. You guys have the floor. Um, I would say that Windows is better because that is what I use for school and for editing and I just really enjoy using it. I would have to say that Apple's better because all your devices get to be connected together and you don't have to go from one device to the other. And there's just a lot to Apple that you can use with it and it's pretty great. And I use it for a lot, so that's my debate. Okay, I will say this. The blue bubble looks better than the green bubble. That's all you need to know. But we'll check out what the judges have to say. I love Mac products. I will go with Apple because you don't get viruses. You're not going with um, Apple or Mac. You're going with Leslie or, or or Abby here. This is not what. This is not your opinion on the argument. This is who won the argument, right, Sandy? Leslie. I would agree, Leslie, because Abby's thought and argument was I like them. That's all she said. I like them better. That was the only piece right. of debate and thing I can go off of. So I agree with Leslie. All right. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. It's been a great time. I think that's all we've got. Ladies, do you have anything else to add? And welcome, welcome to Grace Students Live. Well, good evening, guys. My name is Jake Brom. I am the Grace Students Director at the North Oakland Park Campus, and I've got a ton of announcements for you that you need to know about. Number one, this week is our final week for our series, The U Effect. That also means it's our final weeks for Grace Groups until we break through the summer. Now, you're still gonna be able to see your Grace Group leader all through the summer when we come back and everything else, but we just will no longer have a structured Grace Group time after the service. And when you get into Grace Groups today, make sure you love on your leaders, love on your Grace Group, be excited there, make sure you thank them for everything that they did, and just enjoy your time together within your Grace Groups tonight. Now, that also means next week, we are back live in person for Grace students. I'm so excited, it's gonna be an absolute blast, but there's some things we've gotta remember. We will still be keeping with social distancing within service. So what does that mean? It means six feet apart from everybody at all times, six feet. That also means 
that we're gonna have masks. Now here's some clarification on the masks. You as a student, as someone that is attending the service, you do not have to wear a mask. It is not required of you, it is optional. Volunteers, adults, you gotta wear masks. Okay, we gotta keep everybody safe, so make sure you wear a mask and we'll have some provided for you if you're volunteering. You do not have to wear a mask if you're just attending. Now, we will have a costume contest or a mask wearing contest, let me clarify, a mask contest for everyone that chooses to wear a mask. So, the most creative, possibly the most unique, think outside the box or maybe even inside the box on some options for you on the mask. We will have a prize at each one of our campuses that you will get to enjoy. Now, some other exciting news about next week. We're starting a brand new series called Not Your Normal. Now this is a series that we're gonna be in all summer long and we're looking at how we, as Christians, as believers, look different living day to day than the world does. So we're gonna be doing this all through the summer. It's gonna be really exciting. You're not gonna wanna miss it. So make sure you do one of two things. Either A, you show up in person and join us as we welcome our incoming fifth grader, now gonna be sixth graders starting next week, or you can check us out online. We're still gonna have some online services at visitgracechurch.com that you'll be able to check out and engage in. So you're not eliminating that just because we're back live in service. Last thing I have for you guys, it is summer camp. It is my favorite weekend of the entire year. It's gonna be July 10th through the 13th. That's a Friday through Monday, in case you're keeping track at home. And this year is gonna be phenomenal. We're going back to Camp Table Rock and we are having one giant camp together. So if you are an incoming sixth grader, you get to go. If you are a senior that has just graduated, you get to go. We are gonna go all together as one big Grace Church family at all of our campuses. If you need more information, make sure you go to visitgracechurch.com or gracestudentsathome.com. For all of our information, you can register on there as well. We'll have more information for you on that website as well as in the chat room, all right? But before we get there, we're gonna transition into worship, guys. So let's make sure you engage with everything else that's going on. We're gonna have the lyrics on the screen for you. It's gonna be an absolute blast. I don't, it doesn't really matter if you are in your living room, if you're in your bedroom, if you're watching on your phone, make sure you join us as we jump into worship tonight. Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Uh, before we get into worship, I just wanna remind you again to always remember who we're worshiping, to focus in on who Jesus is, what he's done for us, what he's doing right now. Uh, and to be able just to proclaim that and know that it's true, know that he loves us, uh, so we can just prepare ourselves for the word that's going to be spoken here in a little bit. But uh, let's get to worship and just uh, just proclaim who he is right now.
stop. There's nobody to fit up. Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Who could stop the Hey, what's up, Grace students? My name is Kai Williamson. I am the Grace Students Director over at the South Overland Park campus, and I'm so excited to be here with you tonight, Grace Students Live. Um, I was reminded of a story when I was in high school. I played lacrosse my, my junior year, and one of the things that we had to do at the end of every single practice was go around and pick up all of the lacrosse balls that were surrounding the field. You know, if a shot goes wide or you miss a pass, you kind of just forget about it, let it roll underneath the bleachers, and you have to go pick it up later. But we, we walked into practice one time, we all, we all took a knee, and our coach had this big bucket. And he, he uh, got this bucket up and he dumped it out in front of us all, we're huddled up in a circle. And just all these lacrosse balls just start pouring out of this bucket. And he says, hey, last practice, you guys didn't pick up 23 lacrosse balls. So guess what we're doing today to start off? 23 shuttle runs before you do anything else. Now, I'm sure if you guys are in sports or have had other rehearsals and things and have done something wrong and have been punished by it, you know that this is the worst thing imaginable. So this is what a cause and an effect relationship looks like. The cause is something that you do. It could be a good thing or it could be a not so good thing, negative thing, bad thing, whatever you want to call it. And there's an effect to everything that we do. The cause in this case is we were lazy. We didn't go pick up all those lacrosse balls. And the effect is we were dog tired and sore the next day from doing all of those runs. See, here in life, there's a lot of cause and effect relationships. And there's decisions that we make that aren't so great that lead to not so amazing effects. But we don't really like to talk about those. We don't like to be, um, to brag about that when we are the cause of a bad effect. Like we love to brag when we, the effect is good and it's on us that we made something happen. I think a good example is a group project, all right? If you're in, if you're in class and a group project goes amazingly well and you get a good grade and everything is awesome, then you're gonna for sure brag that you were the one who did all the work and everything was awesome because of what you did. Now, on the other hand, if you were the person in the group that maybe showed up late to all the meetings, that didn't really participate too much. We all know that there's people watching this right now that are like that. If you are that person in a group project, I beg you, please stop. Okay, we, we need you to do work in group projects. But you're not, if you're that person and you guys get a bad grade on that group project, you're not typically going to brag about it, right? Because the effect is negative. We don't really love to own the negative things that we do. See, there's a cause and effect to pretty much everything in life. 
And a lot of times with negative, with not so good things, the effect is losing influence. It can happen in a really big way. I think, for example, like um, something uh, catastrophic happens in your life and people start to talk about it. And next thing you know, everybody in the school or here at church, everybody knows and you feel like everybody's looking at you and watching you and people gossip. You know, maybe um, you were caught at a party one night or maybe you got caught cheating on a test and everybody found out about it. Or you and your boyfriend or girlfriend went too far and, and, and now your group of friends know about it and, and it starts to get around. And, and big decisions can lead to effects. Big, not so great decisions can lead to effects that make us lose influence. Adults that used to respect us now kind of look at us with that disappointing eye. Or maybe friends that used to love hanging out with us now all of a sudden stop texting us back. And from once we had a lot of influence, now we kind of lost it. So that can happen in big ways, but it also happened in small ways over time, drifting from where we once were to something not so great. This is what happened to me my senior year of high school. When I entered my senior year, I started hanging out with not so great friends, and I made some decisions that that weren't the best, and but they were small, and one thing led to another, and then I look back, and I've noticed I've drifted very far from who I once was. Remember, I talked to my parents about this a couple years afterward, and they told me, Kyle, we were asking ourselves the question, where did Kyle go? The person that I was, I ended up drifting over because of small decisions that made me lose influence. And here's the thing, losing influence, it happens to all of us. It can happen over time. It can happen in one big moment. You know, gaining influence is gained over a lot of time, but it's lost really quickly. And a lot of times what we do is if that one of those moments happens to us is we, our natural tendency is to pull back, to draw away, and to isolate ourselves. You know, if something happens that first week, you might decide in your mind, hey, I might not go to church this week or If I go, I'm not going to say anything in small groups because I don't want people to kind of know what I'm dealing with. Or I'm not going to decide to hang out with my friends because it's just easier if I'm just by myself. And after a while, we, we realize that one week turns to two weeks, and then two weeks turns to a couple of months. And before we know it, we are isolated and have been isolated for a long time. You once had a positive U effect, but now you feel like you've lost it and you're not who you were anymore. And if that's what you feel tonight, I want to encourage you by saying you're not the first person to feel this way. See, the Bible is full of stories where people have had these feelings where they feel like they've lost it beyond measure and they can't, they can't regain what they once had. But we see, we see a story in Jesus, uh, with Jesus here in, in Luke chapter 7 to where the influence that this woman had, um, it it was before she met Jesus, she thought it was nothing. She thought she had lost it. She thought it was all over. But after the encounter with Jesus, she had more influence, more of a you effect than she could have ever imagined. It starts in Luke 7, verse 36. It says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. So we've talked about the Pharisees a couple of times, and I know a couple of weeks ago. And so the Pharisees are the people who think that they have it all together. They are the ones who think that they have the most positive you effect. Okay, so this is the context for this dinner. This, the Pharisees think they have it all right. They, they are the best of the best, at least in their own mind. And so we continue on in verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Other translations say an expensive jar of perfume. And and so she brought these things and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, Now, as I read this, you're probably a little bit weirded out because this is something we don't do at all anymore. But back in that time, this was a very common practice to, when you entered a guest's home to wash your feet. 
Imagine, you know, without any paved roads or sidewalks or anything, everything was dirt and all you had to wear were sandals. Your feet would get very dirty and it would be amazing to wash your feet before you reclined at a meal for dinner. And, and this woman, she doesn't only just wash Jesus' feet, she worships Jesus and by washing it with her tears and with her hair and then anointing his feet with this expensive perfume. This is an extravagant act of love and of worship to Jesus. And so let's, let's look at the Pharisee's response in verse 39. It says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he's talking about Jesus, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So the Pharisees had it all wrong about how they thought Jesus was thinking about this woman. See, the Pharisees were remembering all the bad things she had done, remembering her reputation, remembering the sins that she had committed, whether they were huge, glaring things or small decisions over time. The Pharisees, that's all that they could think of. And they thought that Jesus' response was to draw away, to, to not trust, to not want to draw near. But we see that Jesus does the exact opposite thing. Actually, in the Bible, it all the time in the Gospels do people who, who the religious people, the Pharisees, uh, the people that think that they have it all together, those people often think that Jesus doesn't want to be around sinners, that Jesus doesn't want to be around broken people, people who have made mistakes. But all throughout Scripture, we see that those are the exact people that come close to Jesus and who Jesus comes very close to. People with no influence are drawn to Jesus. People who are sinners are drawn to Jesus. People who have just not gotten it right are drawn to Jesus. See, but the amazing thing that this woman didn't do is she didn't hide. She didn't isolate herself, but she went to Jesus. She recognized her brokenness. Weeping came to Jesus and worshiped him anyway. Jesus tells this story And then it goes on to say that he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Simon's the Pharisee, and says, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. See, in this moment, Jesus took the story of this woman and turned it all around. Before this woman had an encounter with Jesus, her cause and effect went something like this. Cause is she was a sinner. She did something, whether it was huge or small. But the matter of it is that she was a sinner. And the effect is that she lost influence. People looked down on her and nobody wanted to be around her. But after she had an encounter with Jesus, the cause and effect changed. The cause went from being a sinner to now the cause after meeting Jesus is she is loved. And the effect of that is that Jesus forgave her and gave her a fresh start. That's the amazing thing about encounters with Jesus is no matter what we've done or or whether it's a big thing or a small thing, no matter what it is in our life, Jesus changes and transforms because of his amazing love. You know what the amazing thing about this story is? Is this woman who thought she had zero influence, who the Pharisees thought had zero influence, ended up having so much significant influence that to this day, 2,000 years after the fact, we are still telling her story. A moment with Jesus can change your influence. It can change the you effect that you have on those around you. See, she thought she lost her influence, her reputation, but it wasn't lost forever. She was redeemed by Jesus' love. And because of that, he set her on this path where she could know him and be close to him 
and make decisions that were right and that, were cl- that would lead her closer to God. See, it's because of Jesus that we can change the effect we have on others. It was in my story when, you know, I was a senior in high school and, and I was taking these steps. I was slowly drifting away from what God had called me to be, from who God called me to be. And it was in the winter of my senior, senior year that through the love of other people, through um, actually starting to listen to God's voice and the Holy Spirit inside of me convict me of some sins in my life. It wasn't until that moment, but I, start, I realized, I looked up and I saw, man, I've drifted. These small decisions I've made, I have drifted far from God. And it was in that moment that, that I was able to remember that Jesus' love for me does not, does not, uh, is not determined by what I've done or the things in my past, but just because his love is great for me. And because of that, he changed my story and he, he gave me influence and he allowed me to be a positive effect on others and put me back on a path in relationship to him. And the way that happens, and, and if you're going through something tonight, whether it's something big or small, you've realized in your own life that you've been drifting, is that the process at how we, how we come to, to be close to Jesus is we first have to realize that we've drifted. And to do that, we need to reflect we need to ask ourselves hard, hard questions and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of sins to see if there's something that we need to repent of, that we need to come to Jesus of and ask for forgiveness. And if in that time of reflection we, we realize that there's something off, something that we have drifted away from God from, it's in that moment that we need to confess. You know, like the woman who came to Jesus weeping That's how we are called to present our sins to Jesus, saying, God, we're broken, we're a mess, but here, take what I am, broken as I am, and we are loved anyway. And so when we confess those things to God, it's like turning a light on in a dark room. What used to be isolated, what used to feel lonely, all of a sudden now is filled with warmth. Another thing we can do after we confess to God is continue to confess to an adult leader who loves Jesus and who wants the best for you. This could be a parent, this could be a grace group leader, this could be a teacher, this could be a coach, somebody in your life who loves Jesus and wants you to be in relationship with him. Because confessing our sins to others, it actually brings this freedom, it it turns on the light, it makes us realize that we can be honest with ourselves and we can live a new life and we can be transformed. So confession is a very powerful tool to help us in following Jesus. And then after we do that, it's then taking steps toward Jesus. See, the best thing about Jesus' love for us is that he doesn't only just forgive us, but he transforms us. He brings us to a new life, which allows us to be closer to him and make decisions that lead us closer to him. So what is then a specific step that we can take to love God more, to to pursue Him in a greater way. Maybe it's spending more time with Him. Maybe it's gathering a group of friends together and and reading the Bible or, or sharing Jesus with a friend. There are things He wants to do in our life. There are things that He wants to transform us into that we look more like Him. And so tonight, if, if you feel like you've lost influence, if you feel like your story is over, if you just want to throw your hands up and say, I can't do it anymore, guess what? That is the perfect place to be in because it's when we realize that we can't do it and that we can't um, on our own be good that Jesus can come in and transform us. So tonight, as we go into a time of worship and as we discuss in group, I'd encourage you to do these steps. Take the time in worship to reflect. What are things in your life that you may need to confess? And then pray and ask God for forgiveness for those things. And if, if you feel a stirring to maybe you need to confess something to a leader, why don't you ask your grace group leader to hang around on the Zoom call and talk to you afterward and, and, and talk about the things that you've been hiding. And then it's then taking that step and what can we do tomorrow to love Jesus in a new and exciting way? So let's reflect on where we are and how Jesus is moving in our lives.
as we worship. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to But you have never failed me yet. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Oh, 
Well, hey, Grace students. Uh, my name is Brian Sander, and I'm the student director uh, here at Grace um, at the campus support level. And uh, what a great service we've had tonight. Um, it's with sadness. I kind of want to tell you a little bit about some things that are happening with Jake Eicher. Jake is the student director over at Olathe. The Lord's um, kind of leading him and Sarah Beth in a new direction. And I wanted to let him kind of share with you guys what God's doing in their life. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So a lot of you guys already know, but for those of you that don't, um, the Lord has really placed it on our hearts to go and help be a part of the launch team uh, for Russell Schultz's church plant in Mission, Kansas. And uh, we're super excited about that. It's definitely a bittersweet time for us as we've loved our time at Grace. We love you students. We love you parents, you families that we've had the chance to get in contact with and to meet. Uh, I, I hope that at some point, if I've run into you or we've met, that there's been a positive impact there. My challenge for all of you would just be this as I kind of transition out over the next few weeks that um, you would just continue to seek what God has for your life. That's what brought us to this position. That's what God is doing in our lives is moving us on to a new chapter where he's got new things for us. And, and I just hope that you uh, can take that as an inspiration to continue to follow God wherever he leads you. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Jake's done such a great job, came on as an intern, rolled into a resident, and then he took the position over at Olathe when we birthed that campus. And uh, we'll just be praying for you guys. You know, what an awesome thing to go be outward focused followers of Jesus and kind of be a part of that vision to plant churches and, and uh, just to be a sending culture. So we love you. Thank you for the four years for helping us lay a great foundation and we will be praying for you. So as you guys see them around, make sure you send them text messages, emails, encouraging them, pray for them. So thanks so much. Enjoy your grace group tonight.